Good morning, everybody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for taking your time to put it here. Put it closer. Thank you for that. Because I didn't want to. But <laughs> I got to talk into it. Um, so thank you very much for being here. It's a it's a happy day, and there is a lot going on in Japantown. We know. Um, with the jam, so the, the museum holding an event and Wesley holding an event, so we want to make this um, all that you need to hear what we're doing as an update, and then also make sure if you want to get to those other events, you have time to do it. My name is Nancy Klein, and I have been a longtime admirer of Japantown and participant, and I'm at the city, I'm both the deputy director of economic development, business attraction, retention, and then also the director of real estate. So that's why we're working on the sale of the portrait. With that, I wanted to um, tell you this is our 109th meeting on the project over the years. So, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so I counted them up. So the great part about that is this is a community which is incredibly involved and that always ends up being a better project. And we have been very, very engaged with residents business leaders, the Japantown Business Association, the Japantown Community Congress, and many, many other stakeholders. And we're very grateful that this continues, thus you being here. So today, what we're gonna be able to do is give you an overview of what we've been doing, what we've been preparing till now, and what the next steps are. In, in a very short way to say, all the work we've been doing today is things that if a private transaction was happening, would have taken place without community meetings. Because now, if we get to a get to a point where the community and the council agree that it's appropriate to sell the land, you begin the work with the developer on the design, the materials, the park, the retail. So with that, I want to make a couple of introductions. There are folks from the related companies and folks from Williams and Day who are the developers. And if they would just stand up so we know who we're talking to. Susan Smart is with the related companies. Chris Longinetti is with Williams and Dane, and Matt Brown is with Williams and Dane. And particularly, many of us know Matt and Chris from their long work in the community. And with that, I, I want to thank you again for being here. It means a lot. And turn that over to Matt. Hi again. Uh, my name is Matt Brown. I'm with Williams and Dane. Nancy said there's 109 meetings, but it really only feels like 106 to me. <laughs> The, uh, anyway, I'm really glad that you could be here today. I know that there's a lot of other things going on. So um, I just want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. We want to give you a quick update on kind of where we're at in the process so that you can understand kind of the decisions that are coming up here in the near future. Um, we also wanted to give you an overview of how our thinking on the site has evolved over time, um, in, driven in part um, quite a bit by the feedback that we've received right, from the community, both at meetings like this, as well as just continuing to talk one-on-one -on -one with different organizations around the town. And then we want to just kind of give you a preview of what's to come. So one of the things I just want to impress on everyone today is that this is, you know, this is also not the last meeting. There's some decisions that are coming up and um, that will um, get us on track to be able to move forward with the development process. And during that process, I'll show you later, we'll have a lot more opportunity, I think, for people to plug in, be involved, and again, help us deliver a project that hopefully we can all be uh, really proud of. So um, today, um, we'll be giving a brief presentation. I think, obviously, you may have some questions and answers afterwards. We can do you know, a few minutes of that, and then we'll just we'll hang out by the boards back there. We can just uh, continue to talk you know, until you're, you're ready to go. So, um, uh, very informal today, just want to um, basically bring everyone up to speed, okay? Um, and I'm going to hand back over to Nancy. So in, in sharing with you where we are, what the heck have we been doing for all these meetings, which is a fair question, um, where we are is in the development of two documents, and I'm going to probably tell you more than you want to know about those two documents, because I really want you to understand. I'm going to give you an overview, and then rather than do questions now, we'll, we'll over to Matt and uh, Chris's presentation, but we will be here. So any conversation, questions, anything more you want to know, happy to share with you. Um, the process today, like I said, is going over to and building up two documents. 
purchase and sale, documents, and a development agreement. And I'm going to refer to my notes because it took me a long time to write it down. I want to make sure I give you all the info. Um, once the terms are in place and council approves those terms, again, that's when you'll really see the design work. You see very preliminary work. And what happens is a developer, until they know they've been giving the go-ahead by council, then they don't necessarily spend a lot of money. It's when they have that approval, they unleash the architects more than they have the structural engineers, the electrical engineers, the mechanical, to really figure out how the project will look and feel and function. So that all has yet to come, and as Matt said, that is what you'll be talking about in subsequent meetings. So the purchase and sale document, it's really very similar to when you sell your house. The documents that you do between buyer and seller and what the title company has to have in order to record the document to make it legal. So some of the things that are in a purchase and sale agreement are the price, what deposits they're going to be, if you keep a deposit or if you lose your deposit, what closing conditions, you know, all the things they have to tell you about termites, etc. Very, very similar. It outlines what the developer generally has to do in terms of how big, how tall, how set back from the street. But then they have to go through an actual entitlement process. They have to get a planning permit and they have to get building permits. This document, the purchase and sale, just outlines a very general platform that they're going to be working on. It also talks about um, aside from general densities, etc., It talks about contingency periods. How long is it going to take them to get their planning permit? You've probably famously heard that sometimes it takes a little longer. We, won't, we don't want that to happen. But getting permits from the city. So it outlines how much time they have to perform under the uh, purchase and sale agreement. It also covers, and this is the attorney's favorite parts, it covers the what ifs. What if there's a huge earthquake? and things can't be going forward. What if they find more in terms of the fuel that was leaked on the property? Who's responsible for that? All of those things of the what ifs, and then it covers the documents that are attached, like the deed and the bill of sale and the recordation of what was on the site and the cleanup the city did. Those are all the pieces that, again, go with any sale of any property, not at all dissimilar from what you do from selling your home or buying another home. So that, in, in, in a nutshell, is the purchase and sale agreement. The other document that we're working on is called the development agreement. And when you have a development agreement, what it basically says, because we don't always do a development agreement, it says the developer is doing something extra, and also the developer is taking on more risk. So the something extra that this project will do is secure the land, the site, for Tyco and the Creative Center for the Arts. That's the extra. The risk is right now we're on the bubble of maybe having an affordable impact fee for housing. Now, the city has no affordable impact housing fee. The city started out with an inclusionary fee, which is really geared to for sale units, and then we got sued. So the city right now does not impose a, a, a cost for developers seeking to go forward for uh, for sale housing, and quite honestly, there's not a lot of for sale housing being done right now. It's finance and stuff, nothing to do with us. And in the city, there's also no fee for apartment units. Uh, in 2009, there was a case out of Southern California called Palmer Patterson, and the building industry said, you know, this affordable housing on apartments notion makes housing more costly, it's counterproductive, and it's more difficult. The courts agreed. So since 2009, when any developer in the state of California is developing housing, they don't pay an affordable housing, uh, apartment dwellings, they don't pay a fee. We are on the bubble of the city maybe considering a fee, but all the years that we've talked about this project, the project was never caused put in affordable. <clears throat> the development agreement simply does two things. One, say it's going to secure the land for Tyco and Creative Center for the Arts. And two, it's going to make sure that everybody knows that once this project gets going, 
it too will not have to uh, create affordable housing because they've already started, they've already done uh, the CCA land, they've already developed what is a lot more quality in retail, et cetera, which is expensive. So that is all that's in the development agreement. And those will be public documents. When we go to council, we generally uh, publish 14 days in advance. So the community is very welcome to look at all those documents and comment on them, either directly to me or at council. So I wanted to make sure you knew what those were. And it's those documents that we very much intend to complete and take to council before the end of this calendar year. So that as Matt comes forward and tells you about schedule, the community will start working on the design and uh, pictures and look and feel and how it functions moving forward. And that's it. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt. Oh, I lied. Not intentional. Helen is going to talk about the guiding principles that we've worked to and how we're proceeding with them on the project. Thank you. Um, when did this 109 meetings begin? 2004. 2004 was when the, uh, what they call the central um, yard came up. And so at that point in time, the Japantown Community Congress and the greater community started meetings. We interviewed developers that were interested in developing on that yard, went through many meetings, and the selection was Williams and Dane had many meetings after that with Williams and Dane, and then uh, the economy went down and we had to wait, and it stayed vacant for all this time. So during that time when the community was working together, we realized that we not only could we concentrate on the corporation, but we had to look at Japantown as a whole. And as we looked at Japantown as a whole, we came up with seven guiding principles. Uh, and we sort of will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so uh, now this year we had um, an EIR addendum, so we updated the 2008 EIR to reflect where we're currently at, um, and that addendum was certified this year. So that kind of brings us up to speed. And in terms of, if, if many of you may recall um, kind of where we were uh, previously, the development that we had before was similar, you'll see, to the concept plan that we have. It has a development on the right side that's on Jackson Street, another uh, development on the left along Taylor, and in the middle was the home for Tyco and a public park going through the middle of the site. So kind of three parts to the site overall. Um, the scale, of course, was somewhat different, right? And I know that at the time, this was actually a fairly scary thing for a lot of people in the neighborhood. Um, but, um, you know, we were kind of looking at building massing that looked something like this, everywhere from six to 13 stories on the site. One of the things, though, I think that's important is that throughout, I think, our development goals and our kind of our vision and, and approach to the site, what we call the first 30 feet, which is you think about that. 30-foot envelope that we all live in as pedestrians in the community, and, and really trying to emphasize and making that a high-quality place. Active uses running on the street, really great streetscape, making sure the buildings are very high quality uh, where they meet the street. So it's about um, creating that great uh, public environment. Of course, getting a permanent home for Tyco has always been a, an important part of this uh, uh, um, site plan. A unique sense of place. I think that means something different here in Japantown versus a lot of other areas because we have so much history and culture to draw on um, that we want to make sure that we can tap into that, right, as we create this development and really use that to help inform uh, what the project looks like. The business environment, you know, I mean, it's been interesting. The, the Japantown business environment has actually strengthened even in the light of um, the economic downturn that we just went through. Um, but we want to help kind of bolster that. You know, we're not here to compete with it. We want to help strengthen it and extend it. Um, so that becomes a very important part. And then we know that parking is a big deal. And we want to make sure that we're responsibly parked on this site so that there's no spillover impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods. So we've continued to engage. We started with a meeting in 2013. We've had ongoing discussions with the community over this time. We actually had a meeting on parking uh, this Tuesday night that I know that some of you were able to attend just to 
um, have a, a, a sole purpose meeting. But I wanted to go over some of the, what I think are some of the main things that we've heard. So I'll start with the biggest issue a lot of people talk about, which is parking. Um, and, and again, to remind you, our goal is we want to be responsibly parked on the site, take care of our users on our own site so that there's no spillover impacts. Um, I think one difference now is we're living in a post-redevelopment agency world. Um, in the past, Morido Village, or even our first shot at this, had a substantial infusion right, of RDA money coming into those projects. We have to cover all of these costs with, through private financing now. So that becomes an issue for us in terms of wanting to make sure we're building as efficiently as possible. Parking ratio and retail parking, you can see the difference between where we were when we started here recently, about 0.9 spaces per unit originally. We're now around 1.4 spaces per unit. Um, retail parking is, is still about the same. Um, I will uh, note that our parking ratios that we're looking at right now meet code outright, even without reductions um, that are allowed under code for uh, some of the things that we'll be doing in the, in the project. So um, that's where we're at with parking. Um, the other thing that comes up with a development like this in, in a community um, is what are the traffic impacts? And certainly one thing we want to be able to do is reduce or mitigate whatever impacts might come from uh, the new development on the surrounding neighborhood. So, of course, one way of doing that is to build less. And um, certainly our density has gone down since when we first started here. We were at around 600 units, now around 450, 460 units, somewhere in there. Same thing with the retail, it's gone down slightly. Um, so, uh, but we also want to you know, look at some of the positive tax that we can take. So what are some of the alternatives that we can provide as part of our project that help people maybe not have to rely on just driving around? So we know that the location is great. We're close to light rail, we're close to the new BART station. There's great bike access to and from downtown and through the neighborhoods here. Uh, but we can also do things like accommodate car share in our projects, uh, subsidized transit passes, you know, some of these other items that are listed down below I think are important parts. Uh, kind of going back to the first 30 feet idea, I mean I think the um, providing a very comfortable and safe walking environment around our project is really important. And I know one thing that we heard um, when we were at some of our past meetings is that um, the uh, intersection at 6th and Taylor in particular has become quite dangerous and there are actually some people that were, that were killed there um, trying to cross the street. So when you think about the seniors that are there at Fuji Towers and trying to get over to Santa Market or just trying to get across some of these streets, we think it's very important that, you know, we, we hope that our project can be used to help, you know, kind of alleviate some of these safety concerns that are, that are happening around the site. Um, but I think the other piece of this is really just to make sure that our development creates a great walking environment, great pedestrian environment on the entire perimeter. And that um, goes for how the buildings act, it goes for how the streetscape is designed, are we incorporating other features, historic features, art features, things like that that really kind of create a rich environment for pedestrians. Uh, Japantown businesses, again, we want to be uh, a significant part of the business community to help um, uh, the business community continue to thrive. Um, previously, we had um, kind of looked at pulling the corner of Jackson 6 back and kind of creating a small open space, a small pavilion there. We've kind of switched around on that and now we're feeling like it's really important to bring that retail right up to the corner and really create that active node and I'll show you some ideas about that later. Um, again, with parking, we want to try to maintain as many on-street resources to, you know, save those for the businesses that are right across the street. So, uh, again, we'll be parking our retail on-site. Um, and then, obviously, um, I think for a neighborhood like this, a business neighborhood like this, the, the walking environment can't be understated. You know, there's going to be 600, 650 new residents in this, in this development. And all of them, you know, if we create a really good environment for them, they're going to be walking out their door and frequenting the businesses, you know, and attracting more people to this area as well, just because we're creating a great place for people to be. So I love, I love the idea of great good place, right? I mean, it's, it's really kind of reinforced the idea that we need to put people first in the design of that environment. 
I think there's a benefit to their businesses as well when we do that because people want to be there. It creates a lot of pedestrian activity. So there's a list of other concerns. I'm, I'm just giving you some highlights here, kind of what we've heard, but obviously creating a unique sense of place is very important and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the scariness maybe of the building scale and heights is coming, uh, coming down some. So before when we were talking about 13 stories, we're now talking about five to six story uh, height of development. Um, the need to accommodate local events or activities, festivals, everything from like the weekly farmer's market to some of the community festivals that happen here. I think the open space on the site, some other things can really help uh, to, to add that. One thing we heard was, we had really emphasized before studio and one bedroom units. It was a predominant part of our unit mix. And people were interested in, what about you know, some family housing here? You know, was, is there a possibility for some larger units, two, two bedroom and three bedrooms? So we've increased those counts overall um, as part of the project. And then the retail approach, I mean, I think we've always felt you know, that the best approach is to look for the unmet needs in Japantown and try to fill those rather than competing with the businesses that are already here. So um, it could be everything from, you know, we, people keep bringing up a pharmacy, it would be great to have a pharmacy, but even looking at existing users who maybe want more space and need more space to survive or, or thrive, like Najia. Um, so we, we'll be looking at all those kinds of opportunities to try to help, uh, again, supplement the retail mix in Japantown and make it more complete. So um, that brings us kind of to where we're at today with our overall design. So this is just basically a concept diagram that gives you a feel for some of the design principles at, at play here. So if you start over on the right and looking at Jackson Street and 6th, you know, we really see that corner as being very important. Um, it's an anchor to that um, retail environment along, uh, along Jackson Street. Um, it's a place where people, I think, can gather and kind of create a great place. But it's also very important because 6th Street, you know, with some of the recent developments along 6th, is also a very important, uh, uh, potentially very important retail street. So you have, you know, the old Cuban restaurant with, uh, is now being uh, redeveloped um, uh, the, as the, uh, I think, the Wenzhou, um, you know, fish and Little, uh, house. It's going to be a great development right across the street. And to be able to pull people back up 6th Street, I think, is very important. So um, we've suggested perhaps setting that first part of the block back a little bit and opening the site up and inviting people back up 6th Street to the CCA, to the park, pulling people up the 6th Street environment. Um, the other piece I would mention is that we are looking at these two sites and trying to open them up to the park as well. So most apartment projects have private recreation space, outdoor decks or pools or things like that. And what we'd like to see is, um, you know, a connection between those areas. If there's a visual and green connection where that kind of spills down into the park so that it's not seen as you know, complete walled city, completely separate, but it's all kind of knit together uh, in a way that makes sense. So conceptually, it basically lays out something like this. Um, and I want to emphasize again that what we're showing you today are not final designs, right? These are just conceptual ideas about kind of where we're at and how we accommodate the program that we've been talking about. So. You can see how, for instance, the spaces, the courtyards in both of these uh, projects um, kind of extend the green space of the park, you know, in and out of both the north and south sides of the block. The CCA um, having presence there on 6th Street with a park behind. And the idea that this park can double as a space that can hold things as diverse as the farmer's market, to impromptu taiko performances, to the movie night. You know, I mean, there could be any number of things that could happen in there. We want it to be fairly flexible and accessible for, uh, for the community. What I want to talk about now is kind of the approach to design. So it would be easy for you to look at these and say, oh, they've got it all designed. <laughs> That's not the case. Um, what I want to talk a little bit about is how do we approach this and what's important? What are the things we're looking at? And what can you expect from us in the future as we come back? So 
as an example, I want to use this to illustrate kind of that idea of creating the active corner, pulling the building back, and being able to look up 6th Street to the CCA um, and really try to create that um, inviting environment. I think as many people know, a lot of these large blocks in Japantown you know, have been fully developed, right, to the point where you can't actually get through them. And so one of the ideas that we've always had here is to open it up and allow people uh, to get through the middle of the block and to invite them into the middle of the block um, as something that um, will help build community, build the connections that are, are important. And then just to take another step, you know, like I said, we think that corner at 6th and Jackson is very important. And so we're going to spend some time, kind of as we've done here, studying, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, how do we, what do we mean when we say we want to create a, a good active corner that's well designed that attracts people, you know, up and down Jackson Street? So, you know, we'll look at both design ideas, but we may also look at other examples that, um, that we think are appropriate and, and draw inspiration from, uh, from other places. You know, I think one thing that we've talked about in the past is that we're not looking, we're, we're in Japantown, I think there's, well, we want to have a Japanese sensibility to it in the sense of fitting in, but that doesn't mean we're recreating a shoji temple in six stories with, you know, and trying to kind of create something that doesn't make a lot of sense. We've tended to look more towards modern, you know, uh, Japanese architecture for some more inspiration like that, um, which I think is appropriate given the fact that we'll be building this in 2015 and not, you know, uh, 1890. So um, that's kind of the approach that we'll be looking at um, with the design. And of course, we'll look at inspiration elsewhere. You know, I mean, it's it's not all, you know, what does the building look like, but also what's what is the flavor and the culture and the history of Japantown tell us um, about how the buildings should be designed and how they should interact with, with the community. So um, everything here from the agricultural history and the canning history of this area to uh, a lot of the cultural touchstones and, and historical touchstones that we see uh, uh, in Japantown. And last, I think it's, it's really important, we're, um, we're very interested in demographics, right? And so there's a very interesting dynamic at play with you know, who wants to live in what I would consider to be a fairly urban uh, type of development, and what do they need, and how do we accommodate that? So um, a lot of our design ideas will also be driven by what it, what it means to live in a fairly high density area walkable pedestrian environment, close to jobs, close to downtown, close to transit. Um, what kinds of amenities, services, design are we providing to the people that we see living here? So with that, what I'd like to do is um, invite Wisa to um, talk a little bit about where um, the Creative Center for the Arts is at right now in their process and, and thinking, and then I'll come back and kind of wrap up with our schedule and process and kind of where we're headed next. Thanks, Matt. So I see a lot of familiar faces who have probably heard us speak about the CCA or Creative Center for the Arts before, but there are some new faces. So I'm going to just give you a building um, as for future residents as well as part of the community amenity of this project development. Um, number one, the CCA or Creative Center for the Arts is a building and an, an infrastructure designed to strengthen and support the arts and cultural and creative ecosystem of Silicon Valley. Um, so as such, we are envisioning no more than 50,000 square feet, um, three to five floors in both office and rehearsal space, um, as well in long-term potential back-end support and providing a central hub for all of our tenants. So in some cases, it might be just someone renting a cubicle because they need some office, office space. In other cases, it might be like San Jose Tycho where we have dedicated space for our rehearsals and classes. Um, in general, it does include, as everybody's been mentioning, a home for San Jose Tycho, as well as our other core tenants who are Silicon Valley Create and Create TV at this time. We've already started conversations with potential other tenants, but 
because the project was on hold for a while, we had to disengage there. So at this point, our discussions with the developer and the city have come up with um, that developer will give back the land that will be the park and CCA back to the city, and the city will then give the land to CCA to develop well, the CCA portion of the land for us to build our building on top of that. So at this point, the CCA is going to be responsible for funding and building our own space. Um, as such, the one item that is still not determined or is in the process of being discussed is the parking for the CCA. Um, we do need day-to-day -day parking for the office workers, the people coming in 9 to 5 on a typical workday. We also need the space towards the evening for people coming in to use those rehearsal spaces um, and those classrooms. Um, and then the core tenants, at least I know for San Jose Taiko, we do have special events from time to time. So we are working with the city and the developer to determine exactly how many parking spaces are we talking about on a day-to-day -day level, as well as how, we would, uh, how that would expand on special event days. As we move forward, though, where we are now, um, now that the project is very close to having a development agreement and purchase and sale agreement approved by council, um, we need to re-engage with foundations. We had already started conversations with many of these people to help us with the building costs. Um, however, we had to put that on hold for a while while it was unclear whether this project was moving forward. So we need to re-engage there, and once the project the proper documents, as Nancy was talking about, as well as our initial funding has been secured, we are going to, as the CCA, refresh our business model that we had already gone over, as well as refine our building plans. Like, we're very much in the same place as the development itself. We have concepts, general designs, um, nothing specific yet, because the project wasn't real yet. We're very close to making it real, um, and that in that way, we can also, as CCA, refine and develop our plans as well. Um, in tandem, we're also going to have to re-engage our talks with potential tenants of the CCA to find out who's actually going to be in this space and how can we design the building to complement their needs as well as to really truly become an asset to Japantown. I mean, so we are first and foremost an arts and cultural and creative center, but we, I mean, I can tell you at least from the San Jose Taiko perspective, the flourishment and continued prosperity of San Jose Japantown is critical to our long-term vision, and we want to be an asset to this community, not only as providing vitality and beauty and heart to Japantown, but also in providing business. We also are commercial entities, even though we're labeled as arts organizations. We, we have employees, we bring in customers, we have, my customers go and eat in your restaurants you know, as, as they um, wait for their kids to finish their classes. So we are very much a part of this community. We envision all of the core tenants right now. We envision ourselves being a part of this community and or are a part of this community. And we thank you for the support that you have shown us thus far. Um, we also thank the city and the developer for getting us to this point. Um, San Jose Taiko was created here in Japantown. We want to be here in Japantown in the long term. We don't have to be here in Japantown to do our work, but it would just be the perfect way to celebrate where we came from and the community that inspires and supports us. So thank you. I should mention, we said, mentioned something about the dedication of the, the CCA land and the park. I should note that the plan right now is that, yes, we will dedicate the land for the park and that we'll be using our, our park impact fees to develop the park. So the idea is that the park is actually delivered, completed, right, by the developer as part of, as part of our work. So um, what I want to do is wrap up um, with a little bit of an overview of where we're headed. So uh, in general, um, Nancy had talked a little bit about over the next three months, we'll complete our negotiations on the purchase and sale agreement and the development agreement. The goal is to have those completed by the end of the year, and I believe that the development agreement needs to go to planning commission first, right, and then, so there's also a planning commission element to this as well for the development agreement part. Um, and so if we look at that, our goal would then be to start in the new year, start our design process, okay? And um, we also, um, I know there's been some, uh, people are aware that the property was recently rezoned to RM zoning, um, but we think we probably still need to go through the PD zoning process and, and go through the city's rezoning process to make the type of development that we're talking about 
work and fit, fit with uh, uh, the zoning code. So you can see that that will take a good portion of the next year to go through both the zoning and the permit phase. Um, after we get those, then we can get to the building permits, and the goal would be to close on the property and begin construction sometime in the first quarter of 2016. So it's still, you know, we still have work ahead of us, obviously. Now, in terms of working with the community, what I would see is a little bit more intensive work up front early next year as we're beginning design. So before things get locked in, we're going to want to continue our work with you and share some ideas and get your feedback on that. And then as we get into the zoning process, and that's the one, two, three, four you can see there. Who knows, it could be another 109 meetings by the time we're done, but I hope not. Um, but as you can, you can see, there's the first part where we're just working with you um, directly, and then kind of as you get into the zoning and the permit process, there are, the city has requirements, right, for required public meetings and things like that. But hopefully we've cleared a lot of the issues, right, early on in the process, and that what we submit is something that people um, uh, are happy with. So that's the uh, general overview. Um, just the immediate next steps, obviously, we talked about the finalized purchase and sale agreement, get the decision ready on the, um, uh, the PSA and the DA, begin our design process and entitlement process in January, and then begin our uh, community needs as well in early 2015. So those are probably the next things that you're gonna see on this project as we, as we move forward. Um, so one last thing, please feel free to call me if you have any questions. Feel free to pass on my contact information if uh, you know that someone who wasn't here wanted to, uh, had a quite specific question or concern that they want to pass on, they're more than welcome to get that to me. I also want to encourage you to visit our project websites, our, our company websites. So, um, and I want to um, spend a moment all, as well just um, uh, talking about related California because I think a number of you may uh, be wondering who this is and, and who they are. We've been working with Related now for the past eight or nine months uh, on this, and uh, they'll be our partner on this project. Um, very well respected firm, actually the, the heads of our, our firm, Homer Williams and the Bill Whitty, who heads up uh, Related California, are uh, almost like the same person, you know, in terms of their personality and approach to development. Um, and we're really, I think, fortunate to have Related by our side as part of this project. Um, Susan's located up, um, just up the, up the bay here um, in San Francisco, in their San Francisco office, so they also have a more local presence than we do. We gotta get all the way down here from Portland, so. Um, but anyway, we're really fortunate to have them as part of our team, and I uh, hope that you'll get a chance also to introduce yourself to Susan afterwards. So with that, I think, I'd like to wrap up, and. Um, uh, some of you may have some questions. We can answer them now, or we can go to the back and do it again. Yes? Yes, I have a question. As a, one of the uh, neighbors uh, in your works found a 13-story proposal in Cary, I was very relieved to see the scale that you're talking about now, but I remember in the last project, it started small and then more big and went on for quite a while well to provide the amenities that the JCC wanted, we have to go higher and have greater density. So what has changed now that would allow you to uh, to fulfill this project on a much smaller scale? Yeah, sure, that's a good question. So what's changed between 2008 and now? <laughs> Got us away from a 13-story building to this. So two things. So first of all, um, what we were proposing in 2008 were condominiums. Um, and what we're proposing today are market rate apartments. So very simply, um, the the construction type is different. We were looking for condominiums, we would only do concrete, right? We don't build wood frame condominiums, we don't believe that it's a high quality product long term for ownership, we just end up being sued. Um, apartments we own and we can control, we can maintain, so it's a little bit different. Um, so that's one element, so we've changed the construction type, and of course when you go to wood frame, the highest you can build is six stories with, with wood. Um, the other thing that's changed, obviously, is the market, right? I mean, the, the um, market for condos was getting hot at the time in 2008 when we were proposing this. Um, it's fairly non-existent right now in terms of there's demand there, but there's not a lot of financing for it. 
So um, our focus right now is on meeting pretty healthy uh, apartment demand here in the San Jose area. Um, we're able to do that and still, you know, it's been, it's been a bit of a struggle on this, to be honest. I mean, it's still hard to make this project pencil. We had a crutch before in the redevelopment agency that could help with some things in the project, and we're trying to do it without them today. Um, um, it's difficult, um, but uh, and the CCA is feeling that a little bit as well. You know that um, I think in the past we would have been able to help a little bit more, and there were three parties at the table. And now we're, we're just um, trying to kind of do the best we can with what we have. Um, but it's still in our mind, the market is good. You know, for this type of project. You know, if we can time it right, we can get it there, and hopefully our partners as well. And once we get this under contract, we'll be able to complete their fundraising and get the CCA uh, in place as well. So that's our goal. Yes, uh, Matt. Thanks. I had a question for you too. I noticed the, uh, the uh, on the diagram and over there on the on the easel, uh, one of the side renderings used the words North Tower and South Tower, and and so I was, you know. A, similar to Michael, uh, a little bit concerned about that. Um, can you just explain, uh, if you're talking about six stories, uh, and I, you showed the sort of the, the frontage, proposed frontage right there along six, does it get, does it, does it the height increase if you go closer to 7th Street on, on the northern side of the uh, south of the residential Yeah, no, it, it doesn't. It'll, it'll remain consistent the whole way around the block. So this is actually showing a five story which is another option that we're looking at um, right now. So we're, we still haven't quite settled in on whether it's a five or six story development yet. But pretty much one, once you've made a decision you know, to go one direction or the other, it, it'll be consistent the whole way. And, and just back on, I mean, on your comment as well, I mean, we went from basically six stories at you know, Jackson and six, and then kind of up as we moved back into the site um, on the previous in 2008. Now it's you know, fairly consistent all the way around. And do you mind if I one one of the follow yeah, sure. on, on building heights? I was out at the parking meeting last night, but I noticed this document mentions a multi-level parking garage, and I didn't see that reflected anywhere on the. Sure. Areas. Where would that be? So what what this reflects actually, if I go to the site plan, is um, uh, a level of underground parking, and then a level of at grade podium parking, and we're still looking at some options again about whether we go underground or whether we have it above grade. The key for us is that if the parking's above grade, it has to be wrapped correctly, right? So the last thing you want is just dead parking next to the street. And so we're gonna try very hard if you know, with any parking that's at grade, right? We'll be designed in a way so we have active frontages around it, you know, some other way of kind of minimizing any kind of impact at the, at the ground level. So then, then you have another Right, yeah, so if you think about where the parking garage would kind of end up, I'll try to, you know, the, the parking garage kind of ends up, you know, outline or something, you know, like so, you know, on the interior of the block. So, do you understand what I'm saying? So, uh, actually, I'm standing on the podium, right? So ground, ground level is right down here. Um, the podium is actually one story up, right? That's where the recreational deck is. And that, that recreational deck is on top of uh, a layer of parking, okay? And then below that, the below grade, there's also another potential for another layer of parking underground. So there's two, basically two levels. Yes, sir. Uh, this and the other uh, Diagram, what do you see the location for the uh, place for the permanent market? Yeah, sure. So what we could see is, it's probably better to use the other diagram. So we could see it basically, you know, spilling in through this area in here. Um, you know, we'll have to look at how much hardscape is going into the park and kind of how it's set up for that. and. Um, uh, you know, I think, and we'll have to we'll have to talk to the people that run the farmers market when we get into the actual design of the of the park and probably the CCA side as well because there'll be a connection right, to the park through there. But that's the, the thinking was that that's where we would we would see it. 
Yes, sir. Sorry, I was late. Yeah, I mean, we still don't know. Basically, I mean, it's it's it, in all likelihood we're going to start on one before the other. It's just, is there a two month lag, or is it a, you know, are we going to finish the South Tower before we move on to the North Tower? We'll figure that out probably in the next six to nine months about what we're, where we're going. Right now, we're going to go through design, right, and rezone and entitle the whole property, but then we're going to have to figure out the timing of that. Um, you know, moving uh, from one one part of the site to the other. Still not not, not sure. Tina, yes. Will the documents um, and any meetings be on the central repository website either the city has or the police can? So, <clears throat> hi, Tina. So the documents will be prepped and available for public review probably 14 days prior to going to, to uh, council planning commission the development agreement uh, has 11 days prior and then yes all of the documents will be accessible on the website and you can always call me again uh, sorry, so what So we still, the, the majority of units in this project will still be studios and one bedrooms, right? We've increased the number of two bedroom and three bedroom from what we had before, but it's still the majority is one bedroom and studios. For the most part, what we see with those small units is that most of those are occupied by one person, okay? Occasionally, you'll get a one bedroom that's with two people. Um, and so obviously with the one people, they have one car, right? The 1.4 per unit is an average across all of the units. Okay. So if most of our if most of our units are are a studio or a one bedroom, then a lot of those units will have two two spaces available for them. But probably you know it might be available on a rental basis, you know, for the second space or maybe some other things that that, that we do. But you know, right now we meet code, right? Of what's required. And in all the work that we've looked at, which Chris I know presented on Tuesday night, 1.4 is probably overparked when you look at comparative projects up and down uh, this part of San Jose that are close to transit, especially. Um, we're, you know, again, we moved quite a ways from where we were to get to where we are right now. Um, and I think we're striking the right balance, to be honest. Um, so, uh, we have, I think, Chris, up to about 700 spaces, right, in the, in the project that are available uh, for the project. Yeah, I, I would like to just say, you know, publicly, this may make me very unpopular, but I, I think the last thing we need are more cars and more congestion, and I get that we 
have to have um, people have an ability to get to retail. We want our businesses to thrive, absolutely. But this project is very, very close to transit. And a study was actually done several years ago about the Japantown area that showed that if people feel safe and it's aesthetically pleasing, they are willing to walk more than a quarter mile to get to uh, transit. So there's that. And then there are other options, bike share, car share, etc. So my hope is, is that we don't inundate you know, this, this area with yet more cars because we, it's been shown, you know, the congestion is horrible and it's, in, in a lot of cases, it's dangerous. You know, there's a lot of people zipping around and not paying attention. So I just, I want to applaud you for the studies that you've done and I'm in full support of what you buy right now. Sure. I was just going to add, so at the park we meet on Tuesday, we also discuss, I mean, what we want to make, we want to encourage people to use alternative rules of transportation. Part of that would be education, so it's about discussing what is going to be available on the site or in the kind of we have to share and making, it, making people understand what their options are besides what we Thank you. Who else wants to do, go to the restaurant, go to Half Mile for lunch or even? I mean, I mean, have have it. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how many besides it. <laughs> well, and again, I would, I, would, I would offer that we have a lot of new customers that we're hoping are going to frequent the Japantown businesses living right there now in the middle of Japantown. Uh, Ms. Yes, uh, I just want to uh, thank you for the That's right. Now, one, um, of course, we will have, you know, I think we have about 40 to 45 spaces in there for, for our retail, right, which right. which but it should be publicly available to serve the, the retail that's in there. But, but yes, and, and we're not, just another point, thank you for bringing that up, because just to clarify, we don't count any on-street parking, right, as part of what we're providing on the project. So all the parking that we're describing is internal to the project to serve the development. Yes, sir. The thing is that, um, as it says now, on the weekends, all the street parks are just put up anyway. That's without any traction to the belt. So that's, there's got to be some garage parking for retail. Is that what you have in mind? For, for our retail, the retail that we're building is a project, yes, that's right. Yes, sir. Just while we're on the topic of parking, I, I was just curious about what Lisa said about uh, the, the, the parking you're talking about, Matt, doesn't include whatever parking might be needed for the CCAs. Do you, you want to say anything about how many spaces you guys think you're, you're going to need and where you would look to fight those? Sure. Um, I, I'm hoping I'm not going to overstep. So we're currently discussing the city is hope they have a proposal out that they're betting to provide CCA with 20 to 30 sub-level parking spaces, so under the CCA. Hasn't been completely vetted yet, because um, so, funding, I mean, a parking space that's sub-level is like forty to $50,000 per space, I think we were talking about. So it is a big, the, it's, uh, it's the funding that's going get, to get to us. But we are in current discussions with the city and the development trying to figure out, you know, can that sub-level parking at least be built even before CCA builds itself as um, the development is going to be more south towers and even state costs and stuff like that. Um, but that's where we are currently. And that should... I, again, early in our talks, but we think it just applies for our, definitely our day-to-day -day and most of the people using the building. Um, it's just the big special events that are questionable, which don't happen. Right. And, and the, the, the 50,000 square feet in this uh, in the structure, I mean, there's a performance space in there too. I'm not yeah. There's not a... No, it's, it's a creative center. We're really focusing on so many, a lot of the arts and culture groups, I don't know if anybody else wants to go. 
but um, we've lost our personal spaces because the warehouses keep getting torn down to the apartment. <laughs> so if we, there's a lot of performing spaces available in San Jose, but not enough for personal spaces. So we're, we're providing that back end. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. On that, uh, there seems to be uh, another uh, diagram. There seems to be a designation for an out outdoor performing space. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be flexible. I think it'd be a mistake to design an outdoor space so it could only be used as a stage, but it could certainly, one of the uses of the site, you know, could be very, very well designed to, to act as a stage or act as a performance space. Uh, Georgia, and then we'll back. Um, I know that this is a great thing for the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if everyone knows, but my husband was born in the corner of Seventh and he's seen a lot of changes, and the changes have been really nice. Most of them have been very nice, but I know that everybody thinks the parking is okay for most of them, and I know they're trying their best to do it. But I can't have a guest in my home because there's no place for them to park, and it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. And I try really hard to think of some way that we can, the residents that are experiencing this, and I seem to be the only one, because I'm a seventh container, so I'm surrounded by condominiums, apartments, apartments, and now I'm gonna get more apartments. So there is no party for someone to come and see them. And most people that come to see me are not 30, 40, 50, they're 50, 60, 70, and 80 year olds. So I have to find parking for these people by going to a church that's a block away and ask if I can use their parking place. I have to go to the business next door to me that I own that someone else runs and he lets me park people. It's hard. I just want everyone to know it's hard for people to live in this neighborhood and I'm not leaving and my kids are not leaving after I die because it's been in the family since 1920. So I just wanted to let everybody know how I feel about the park. And it's hard. Yeah, that's why right now the parking uh, research is the current situation. Right now, overflowing people can park in the uh, corporate yard. But if this uh, corporate yard takes place, where do we find the park? When you own the developing, and where's the parking space for, for the, uh, the uh, businesses if they, you block away? And also, right now, the seven senior, uh, six it's the senior house. They has uh, almost 100 units. They have uh, no parking space. Right. And who will become busy to where to park? So the good part is part of the conversation here with me is at the parking meeting. There's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to all work together. There's there's one piece which is the project, but and it's fulfilling the goals beyond the goals that are set out for parking code. We're working with CCA to responsibly park as well. And then there will be an ongoing conversation of parking. And the city is working, um, trying to work, to be really good. For example, with your restaurant, you have no parking requirement, yeah. which the city might, which some might say is irresponsible to let you go forward with no parking. But there's an avenue to do that because it was grandfathered. And we want to see, and we so thank you for all of the work that you're doing and the cost and the risk that you're doing. So we understand that there's risk on your part, and we're also trying to do what we can to enable you to go forward in the beginning. So the conversation at Monday night, oh, I'm so sorry. The, the conversation was about there's resources in the area, and how do we use those resources much more wisely? How do we look at how a, a big range of things, from the wellness center, are there spaces that we can create behind the wellness center? That's a great idea. There's uh, resource and parking spaces at the churches where sometimes maybe that we'd be able to share and maybe there's things that the city can do for example like pick up insurance costs to make it a little easier for the, um, the property owners which happen to be churches to, to move forward though that's really worthy of discussion there was a number of conversations about better signage even to the point for those because everybody has a cell phone uh, of how to put sensors in the street to let people know what spaces are available where so the conversation about parking will go on as we continue to grow as a community and a city. So we're all engaged together in that, and, and we will continue to be.
Yes, sir. Uh, I just want to say this. I mean, uh, I've lived, uh, other than the Marion Square and Patty Corner from that building, I've lived here for 10 years. I've raised my son here. Uh, and, you know, I share a lot of concerns with people here. here. I mean, my personal belief was, was about building height, but, you know, I can't, you know, to, to the to the uh, person spoke before, you know, I, I don't have guest parking. And, yeah, I guess I would just say that, you know, personally, I'm I'm really excited to see this going forward. I would much rather, after 10 years, yes. see something great that's yes. respectful of the community.